Let's get started again. Oops. Attendance lists for the second round. Right, okay. Um, <clears throat> now, back to the Middle East. Yes, we were talking about the possible implications, I mean, from your perspective, to the extent that you had a chance to follow. Of course, I don't expect you to know everything uh, which uh, has taken place since the 1990s. Most of you, if not all of you, were attending kindergartens or primary schools back then. So, but at least uh, as a way of learning uh, your subject, it is essential that you go back and read in retrospect what happened there. And, and many of the uh, events that unfold, of course, when, when news coverage, of course, uh, taking place uh, on TV channels, there are also references to the past events. So they are not only talking about what has happened today. For instance, if I'm not mistaken, there is this so-called WikiLeaks. You know, have you heard that? WikiLeaks. The Wiki, there is this Wikipedia, which is quite, um, you know, uh, important to get first hand information, but of course never 100% rely on anything or everything you find uh, on the internet because you have to double check the, um, the, the veracity of the information. Because Wiki, Wikipedia and other types of encyclopedia are also open to individual contributions. Well, there may be some, I don't know, uh, screening process, but still they cannot be knowledgeable about every single thing. Anyway, the WikiLeaks, uh, I did not have much time to read into the uh, uh, subject, but what I gather from this uh, somewhat superficial collection of information, uh, there is this leak of information about what happened during this uh, war, prior to the war, 1991, after the war, and prior to the second war in Iraq, 2003, and afterwards. So, uh, of course, the situation is uh, somewhat tense. Um, still, uh, very tense, but was tense. And th th there is this talk about some private contractor firms, which were supposed to provide security to not necessarily the Iraqi people, but more specifically to the American and British and other uh, countries top leadership and soldiers as well as such individuals, civil individuals who, who were part of the administration or part of the, of course, administration not uh, from within the Iraqi uh, people, I mean some uh, American people as well as Iraqi administrators. And these private contractor firms who were supposed to uh, provide security uh, of these individuals and groups of people have committed certain crimes, such as uh, the Blackwater, which is, and this is so reported on the media, uh, and, and in, on various instances everywhere, for so many years since uh, 2004 and, and onwards. So this is therefore uh, an uh, indication of what happened in the past. And if you follow the WikiLeaks or other type of information coming, uh, in retrospect, I mean, making references to what happened in the past, you might have an understanding of what really happened there. So, there are also other countries like Israel, Jordan, Egypt, the uh, Gulf countries. What, in your opinion, uh, or how, in your opinion, these countries were affected from the Iraq war? Yes, Anil, any particular opinion about how Israel may have affected from the situation in Iraq. I mean, when I say a country being affected from a certain development, of course, there are many ways in which you can make comment. I mean, you can say, like Fatih said at the beginning about the situation in Syria, its economy was badly affected from the uh, immigrants, I mean, people who fled into the, uh, fled their countries and went into the Syrian territory. But they're also uh, affected, being affected, we mainly look, not exclusively, but mainly look at the change in the threat perceptions of states. 
because our concern is primarily, first and foremost, is the security situation. I mean, of course, uh, Professor Erin Cialda might be interested in the economic situation, I, or somebody else might be uh, interested, uh, Esra Chuara might be interested in the sociological situation, and Mustafa Kibaral is interested in the security situation. So, therefore, these events can be covered from various perspectives, and all of which would make sense, and of course when you combine all of them together, you have correct assessment of the situation, which gives you a much better idea. But given the limited time that we have and limited knowledge that each and every one of these professors, including myself, has, and therefore we cannot go beyond certain level and we cannot make comments on everything else. But uh, first and foremost, the thing that we look at, how a particular sh sh change in some particular country affects the threat perceptions of other states. And that's why this is this, this book as well. Uh, it's titled National Threat Perceptions in the Middle East. Meaning how the threat perceptions of these countries uh, was affected by the situation in Iraq. So this is uh, an essential point. When we talk about how Iraq affected uh, the, uh, the rest of the region, we mainly look at the change in the perception of threat for these countries. Of course, threat perception is something that, which may be uh, covered extensively, and, and threat is composed of many uh, sort of items under this heading of national threat. But uh, we are confining our attention mainly uh, to the situation in the, you know, military security dimension. Sorry. Um, again, uh, having said that, why do you think, or how do you think, uh, things have changed in the name of Jordan, for instance, or uh, Egypt, or Israel? Yes, could you? Can you speak up? Can you hear her? So if you can't hear her, why don't you say that you can't hear her? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, change, well, uh, Gurjan says, the attitude of Israel towards the Biological Weapons Convention and Chemical Weapons Convention changed after the loss of faith in uh, what ANSCOM has done, actually, so because ANSCOM uh, was not able to f finish the job. And so what, yes, change, but in what direction? I mean, in the... Mm -hmm. All right, so while there might have been a possibility for Israel to go ahead and sign and ratify the Biological Weapons Convention and sign and ratify the Chemical Weapons Convention, actually they did sign the Chemical Weapons Convention, but they have not ratified it. Well, this is another dimension of the problem because uh, and again, we have discussed this issue extensively over this past weekend uh, among you know, uh, these people sitting around the table, this rectangular table, uh, but there was a round table type of discussion. And, and Israelis always made reference to the chemical weapons, biological weapons capabilities of countries, some of the countries in the region, and others made references to the nuclear weapons capability never being acknowledged though by the uh, Israelis. And, you know, uh, again, for instance, uh, Israelis are concerned very much, not only and merely the presence of uh, chemical and biological weapons or ballistic missiles in the hands of their uh, enemies here in the region, but also they are equally, if not more, concerned uh, with the presence of all sorts of rockets or short-range missiles and also hand grenades uh, or RPGs uh, or other types of uh, explosive devices and of course suicide bombers which and who equally takes, uh, take lives of people. 
So therefore, uh, the situation in Iraq, and more so after 2003, invasion of uh, Iraq by the US forces, as well as British and some other forces, uh, created this uh, chaotic situation in Iraq. The militia wars among themselves, as well as outside intervention, and Iraq has become the open market for all sorts of weapon systems, all sorts of uh, terrorist organizations to get training, and all sorts of uh, smuggling activities, which of course uh, became a major source of concern for Israel because there are people whom they believe go all the way from other parts of the world, come to Iraq, then cross over the Jordanian territory, or by way of Syria and Lebanon, they sort of stage their attacks on the Israeli people here and there, Haifa, Tel Aviv, uh, other places. And then this is an equal concern for the Israeli uh, uh, people, security people. So therefore, uh, this is, I mean, looking at the issue from the smallest or slightest or lightest uh, 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 concern or weapon system to up to the chemical and nuclear biological weapon system, ballistic missiles, there is a wide range of uh, issues that equally cause concern for Israel. But this is somewhat typical of uh, uh, Israeli security analysts um, because Israel is looking forward to having 100% security, which doesn't exist anywhere. There is no such thing as being foolproof, secure, no infiltration, no leaks, no attacks, no killings. Well, I w that would be the ideal world for every country in the world, but this is not the situation. And every country, even though this is not the desirable situation for anyone, every country has to tolerate a certain level of insecurity. So you cannot be 100% secure, and you cannot take every single measure that might necessitate for 100% security, which may never come. And certain things that you, may be, you might be doing, you may be doing in the name of providing this 100% security, may in turn bring you insecurity. Because certain things cause so much resentment among the population of other you know, countries and, and give rise to certain new groups who may not have had any such decision in the past, but because of what, for instance, one of the governments might be doing, so they become an enemy of that government or enemy of that country, so become someone who commits uh, attacks or just you know, uh, also commits himself or sacrifices his life or her life and in order to cause some damage to the country. I'm talking about these attacks on Israeli cities or Israeli you know, uh, population. So therefore, Israel has been affected by and large, but also uh, uh, had also certain impact on the developments on Iraq, which again we will talk in the coming weeks separately when we will look at the issue a little bit uh, from Turkey's perspective because, I mean, this is a Middle East Secure uh, Structures course. This is a course on the Middle Eastern countries. Turkey is not usually and not necessarily counted as one of them, but still for reasons that I explain and also will explain in more detail, uh, Turkey has uh, big stakes um, in, in the security situation in the Middle East and has been significantly affected from the situation in Iraq and also is likely to be affected and it's still at present time being affected by what is going on with respect to Iran and nuclear capability. So we will talk about all this in the coming weeks. Jordan. Jordan, um, something specific took place with respect to Jordan after the first Gulf War in 1991. I mean, if there are, let's say, uh, two or three major events, fundamental stones, the, the yardstick uh, type of developments in the, in the Middle East, uh, one of them has to do with Jordan. Any idea what might this be? Yes, again? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's 1993 September, but you might be right. I, I cannot keep dates so well in my mind, but you might be right. Um, after Iraqi war, or the war on Iraq, actually there are two things that this might be very small, a tiny difference. We, there is this 
thing that we sometimes interchangeably use and sometimes correctly, sometimes incorrectly. Uh, war in Iraq or war on Iraq. If I were to ask you which one is which, I mean first war and second war, or 91, 93, uh, or 2003, which one goes to which one? Exactly. I mean, this very good. This is this is important because the first one was not in Iraq. It was on Iraq. It was against Iraq to, you know, uh, push them out of the uh, Kuwaiti territory. But the second took place in the Iraqi territory, and therefore still maybe on Iraq. I mean, against Iraq, but took place in Iraq. So this is a, a somewhat a, a tiny. Uh, uh, difference, but some, something important. And um, this, uh, after the first war on Iraq, there was this, uh, which was later on revealed as being the secret peace process, which took place in Oslo, at the capital of Norway. Of course, uh, these Scandinavian countries were quite anxious for so many years, not only recently, to be um, acting in between the conflicting parties to bring them together in this nice settings in places like Oslo, Stockholm, and where you relaxed and nice environment and far from the public pressure in your countries where there's this situation is chaotic and you are being treated so well. And, and there are also people who almost uh, constantly provide you some encouragement material encouragement, spiritual encouragement to act certain way in certain way or to take certain steps that would bring some, I don't know, positive uh, developments in the future that where you can find some solutions to your problems. For instance, remember back in 1978-79 there was this Camp David uh, meeting between Sadat and Begin and they have cut the peace, cut, cut a deal for peace agreement which paved the way to uh, Egyptian official recognition of Israel. Actually, before that, as you know, uh, Sadat has gone to Israel and spoke at the Knesset, at the is Israeli parliament, which, of course, uh, caused the expel uh, expelling of uh, Egypt from the Arab League. And the headquarters of Arab League was uh, moved to Tunis, uh, Tunisia, uh, the, the capital of uh, Tunisia, Tunis. So, in, in Oslo, the parties have talked extensively, secretly, because one major difficulty that, again, on this past weekend in the United Kingdom, in London, somewhere pretty close to London, in a castle outside of the intervention of anybody, um, one major problem was this issue of recognition of Israel. Israel was not recognized by any other country prior to Egyptian recognition. And this is something that even though de facto they come together with I mean, Arabs and Israelis, Iranians, whom you would think being the bloody enemies of each other, come together in this kind of settings. Uh, there is this so-called track one, and track two meetings. This is uh, a meeting between the government officials or intergovernment uh, official or formal meetings. And track two is between NGO, uh, non governmental officials, non official. Nothing is binding. And there's also so called track one a health, something that was recently produced and which is attended by partly governmental and partly non-governmental people. And our meetings are this kind of meetings. There are some officials from representatives' countries, but also uh, they sp speak uh, on, in their individual capacity without making any formal commitment. But this kind of meetings are places where um, parties exchange their opinion they put their proposals before, on the table and better occasions, better opportunities to better understand what the other side had to say. 
or has to say. So therefore, Oslo was such an environment. It was actually a track one type of meeting with the participation of uh, official people because after which, if there was going to be any peace treaty, that would be among the governments or among the officials, but also attended by non-governmental meeting people because there are many specialists, experts, on all these Middle Eastern issues, um, and those who know about the economic situation, those who know about the sociological situation, demographic issues, military issues, technological issues, anything that you can think of being part of these uh, uh, large-scale negotiations took place in Oslo, which produced something uh, that was quite a breakthrough at the moment, was uh, um, Jordanian official recognition of Israel. So uh, that Oslo peace, which was conducted separately uh, and, and uh, behind the doors, behind, uh, away from the scrutiny, scrutiny of other people. So in the meantime, there was actually a formal peace negotiation which took place in uh, Madrid. There was Madrid peace process, or Madrid Middle East peace process. And this process is still continuing, with on and off. I mean, there were uh, you know, up and uh, down uh, sort of developments. Uh, some expectations were high at certain points, were down at, at other points, etc. So this is something that uh, goes on. And Jordan, uh, of course, uh, this time, unlike the isolation of Egypt from the Iraq, uh, sorry, uh, Arab League, Jordanian recognition of Israel did not produce such results. I mean, at least officially. Yeah, there might be resentments in the Jordanian public domain, in the streets of other Arab nations as to why Jordan recognized uh, Israel. But when you look at this map, and when you remember things that we have learned uh, over the past several weeks about the secure, security situation with respect to Jordan, you can see how influential Israel is on Jordanian security. And Jordan was actually the uh, King Hussein, well, he was kind of ambivalent. Well, Jordanian fr friend of ours will not like this term, but it is at least so perceived from outside. And it was not quite clear whether Jordan supported the uh, resolutions. Yes, they did indeed, but a Jordanian King Hussein uh, made such statements publicly, which were broadcast by TV channels such as CNN International. I listened myself live as to what he said, um, and said such things that were really bitter statements about the United States coalition forces. So in a sense, uh, politically or formally, he was on one side, but on the other hand, he wanted to balance its country, his country's situation by making such statements that would appeal to the hearts of and minds of the Arab, Arab streets. So yet, uh, actually, Saddam Hussein considered Jordan, if not the, a, you know, a bloody enemy as he considered Israel, but he did not like, Saddam Hussein did not like the idea uh, that King Hussein somehow supported the uh, coalition forces. Uh, therefore, Jordan was very much concerned about its security vis-a-vis -vis Iraqi threat uh, uh, perceived from Iraq. Same also applies to Syria uh, with respect to Jordanian uh, Syrian relations are not, are not that perfect, are not that well. So Israel, in a sense, in return for Jordan's um, mild attitude, so to speak, uh, against Israel. I'm not talking about you know these public statements, rhetorical statements, which are pronounced, spelled out for public consumption. I'm talking about what is what has been done in the you know formal official ground, and Israel was quite happy with the performance of Jordan after the war, and which produced this uh, official recognition. Why is that so important, and why is it that Israel is so concerned about? Uh, of being recognized. This is something psychological. I mean, everybody knows, and I, I cannot just say this uh, here explicitly, but there are people from the region, 
even this past weekend or in the previous conferences last year, the year before, or many years ago, they always say, let's admit that there is such and such state, whether we like it or not, called Israel. And let's also admit these are Arab people, I mean, from Arab countries. Officials, non-officials, or ex-official people who were in the past or, you know, or still serving as advisors who you know, occupied higher ranks in their governments, in their countries, they say, let's admit there is the state of Israel and it is not going to go anywhere and that we are not going to beat them militarily and economically, but we cannot publicly or officially admit their presence, we cannot accept their presence, we cannot recognize their presence to be true to our Arab cause. So, therefore, de facto and de jure, uh, of course, there is this difference. But, and therefore, Israelis are not anymore, as has been the case in the past, especially prior to the uh, Egyptian official recognition, they were, there was like some sort of a psychological void, I mean, spiritual void in their mind. Uh, they, they, they were concerned about being recognized and they sort of did a lot of things, uh, poured a lot of uh, sources, money, uh, and, and for lobbying purposes and for other purposes, for political influence, to get the, if not official recognition, but at least sympathy from within the Arab world. They have been ex uh, su uh, successful to the extent of uh, you know, securing Egyptian recognition, which was actually at the expense of returning Sinai Peninsula, which they had uh, occupied back in 1967 with the 67 war. And Egypt, what, one of the reasons why Egypt recognized the state of Israel was to put an end to these hostilities, maybe, and a quite noble and, and, and objective, but the real purpose, I would say, to get this Sinai Peninsula, which is a significant uh, proportion of land of e e Egyptian territory and also something that provides a strategic depth. Strategic depth is not only the title of the book written by our foreign minister, Ahmed Davutoglu, but also something that is used in the terminology of strategic studies. It is the distance between your valuable assets and the uh, enemy's capabilities. So if you can keep your most valuable assets, like your capital, like your large population centers, or like your most advanced technological sites or facilities, and if there is a significant distance that you can feel confident that it, they are beyond the reach of your enemy, then you can believe that you have a strategic depth. Strategic depth is therefore something that you should uh, keep in mind. And we will discuss this issue again later on, just to give you an idea. So uh, Israel secured the recognition of Egypt, yet it was not that satisfactory in terms of political uh, objectives. Because after all, they proclaimed their independence in 1948, most possibly sometime around 1967-68, they must have acquired their nuclear weapons capability, even though they, not, they do not acknowledge nor deny. These are important developments. They had significant conventional military capabilities, state-of-the-art technologies, the latest uh, technological innovations in the, in the military sort of industry, yet quite confident about their military capabilities, military prowess. I mean, they, 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 they could trust that they would not be, uh, especially after the Yom Kippur War and onwards, they would not be invaded or no, no Arab state would even dare attacking again for so many years. Yet, they said something's missing. I mean, you know, someone might be quite rich, handsome, has everything in his life or her life. Still, there is something missing. Like, and some people therefore go for some adventures, go to Himalayas, like my friend Nasu, or uh, some other people just you know, go into politics for political adventure. So this may not be a good example, but Israelis, even though 
in terms of uh, economic capabilities, prospered over the years, especially uh, you know, for, since the end of the 80s and well into the 1990s, uh, there was a significant investment coming from the United States into Israel. For instance, many of you use computers, laptops, right? And Intel pr uh, processors are being produced in Israel. It's one of the world's biggest producers. So this, this kind of developments must have made the Israelis quite happy. They are, they are uh, secure, well, of course, with the exception of these attacks uh, here and there every now and then, but still their territory uh, up until this Iranian threat was not under the threat of any uh, major country. Economically prospered, politically coherent within themselves. Yes, Israeli politics may be in some respects may, may be much more chaotic when compared to Turkish politics, but still there is a certain sense of unity against vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the foreign uh, or foreign policy issues. But still, they were not happy with that. They, they, uh, they sought recognition. They, they wanted to be recognized, to be taken seriously by every other country, even if they may not be, you know, uh, 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 you know, a love affair with the Arab countries, but still a certain stability was what in their, uh, in their mind. But still, that has not come, with the exception of Jordan, and also some countries like Oman, like Morocco. They have not recognized, of course, but they have established some trade relations with, if not directly, but indirectly with uh, Iranian, uh, sorry, uh, Israeli firms or Israeli uh, government. So um, these are things that Israel concern was good. Now, nowadays, what we hear is that they do not seem to be very much concerned with this recognition issue, especially after, as I said, many Arabs have come to the point of de facto admitting the presence, the existence of uh, Israel, except for some statements made by um, Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. All right. Now let's say a few words about Egypt. How do you think the situation in Iraq may have affected the uh, Egyptian foreign policy because, or security policies? Because uh, when I say being affected, we look at the threat perceptions, change in the threat perceptions. What, in your opinion, uh, the Iraq war and the ensuing process, I mean, from 1991 up to 2003 and after 2003 um, at present time, what do you think might be the major Egyptian concerns in terms of uh, the implications of the Iraq war? What, in your opinion, let me put it that way, was the situation for Egypt before the Iraq War and after the Iraq War, 91 and onwards. You should be able to make such comparison or analytical discussion. What about our guest speaker? Yeah, one point well made <laughs> by our guest speaker today um, was, you know, the impact of Iraq war on Egypt's claim to be the, the leader of the Arab world. Because we have discussed this before. Egypt, Syria, and Iraq have always found themselves in a rivalry for the leadership in the Iraq world. And Nasser's policies, I mean, yes, Nasser had a wide-ranging impact on the rest of the Arab world, and he found himself in such a position that he must uh, also uh, inter intervene in the Yemen war. I mean, Egypt intervened in Yemen. We, we talk about this. So Egypt, that was partly, maybe, uh, Nasser's person interpretation, but also partly because some in the uh, 
Egyptian administration may have uh, encouraged Nasser to do so in order to, you know, uh, to claim uh, or to prove Egypt's uh, leadership in the Arab world. Yes, again, you would like to say something? I was going to ask how can Egypt be a leader in the Arab world since they are not even in the Arab world, they are not even in the Arab league? They are now, I mean, in the Arab league. Well, well uh, actually, Arab League was established in 1945, and the headquarters been in Cairo, and so remained until uh, Sadat's visit to Tel Aviv, and then uh, the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. They were expelled from the Arab League, and the headquarters of Arab League moved to Tunis, as I just said. Now it's back in Cairo, and uh, Amr Musa, the former Egyptian uh, foreign minister is the secretary general of the Arab League. And Wael al Assad, a friend of mine whom I saw just last weekend, uh, as I said, is going to contribute to the um, job of the Jordanian delegation for the simulation. So you're lucky. So will the uh, so, uh, Egyptian uh, ambassador, Nabil Fahmi, is going to give some hints about um, Egyptian policies. But Egypt claim uh, the leadership position in the Arab League since from the beginning, and Nasser, in a sense, uh, well, crowned this. I mean, just, in a sense, uh, uh, underlined or emphasized and made many people believe that Egypt was the uncontested leader of the Arab League. And that was actually the reason why Syria uh, asked from Egypt to join their capabilities. I mean, there is this United Arab Republic. 58 to 61. And then after Egypt's return to the Arab League, still uh, Cairo, of course, again became the headquarters of the Arab League. And uh, Egypt, Syria, and Iraq still found themselves in a race because Saddam Hussein was no less an obsessive person with respect to the Arab uh, uh, leadership. So was Hafez al-Assad, the uh, former president and the father of current president Bashar al-Assad's father, who was a leader of the uh, of, of Syria, who also claimed leadership in the Arab world. So these three countries always uh, raced, so to speak, for the Arab League, uh, sort of Arab leadership. Um, so therefore, I don't think there should be any misunderstandings in that. But this is, of course, a political issue. And Egypt found itself in a rather shaky position after the Iraq war because especially its economy was badly affected. Because Egypt was not a rich country. Well, they have some oil reserves and some natural gas reserves, but this is, these are far be from being even sufficient for their own economy for their own consumption, but um, still it is not a rich country. And Egypt, just like Turkish workers going to Germany and other countries in Europe, like France, Austria, etc., uh, and sending their you know, uh, earnings, parts of uh, their earnings back to Turkey, and Turkey for so many years really relied on the money uh, foreign currency, foreign uh, exchange currency coming from the Turkish workers who live there, left their families behind, and you know, these monies deposited to Turkish banks after a while have become a source of uh, real uh, and significant amounts of uh, money coming to the Turkish economy. Egyptian economy also depended on the Egyptian workers in the Gulf states because rich Gulf states had a lot of oil and gas, still they have a lot of oil and gas, but very few populations, and who would not necessarily be uh, willing to do certain jobs like cleaning the streets or serving the uh, in guests in the restaurants or housekeeping in you know, some touristic facilities, etc., etc., or work in the petroleum ref refineries or in the construction business. So many Pakistanis or Malaysians and others, but mainly Egyptians, because they spoke the very same language, Arabic language. So many of them went to the Gulf after the oil boom, like the 70s. 
So throughout the second half of the 70s and 80s, up to the 1991 Gulf War, many Egyptians have gone to uh, these countries. This has helped the Egyptian economy not only in the sense of reducing the unemployment, because many of them who would otherwise be unemployed in Egypt have found um, employment in other countries, but also there was money coming from these people to their families, etc. But 1991 war actually disturbed the situation deeply because of, of course, the situation of Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, the war in the, in the region, and many of the jobs were lost because many of the jobs or, or production or in constructions or there was no tourists actually who would just spend uh, his or time in, in Qatar hotels or you know, the Arab Emirates, etc. So many of those people who work in the service sector or construction business or some manufacturing business have gone back to Egypt. So now that this money coming from these people was cut off, but also these a new a large sums of people who would add to the uh, group of already unemployed people in Egypt. So therefore, this is something that uh, significantly uh, affected the situation. But of course, this is again the economic dimension that could be further elaborated by economic um, sort of uh, econo economists who study this subject in, in more detail. But of course, this had implications for the security situation because uh, Egyptian economy, which could barely or hardly um, cover the expenses of its military spending, much of which actually was coming from the United States in the name of Drake foreign aid, military aid, or in terms of uh, donations of some weapon systems. Of course, this has also uh, 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 was badly affected. So uh, there were some concerns about what to do with the Iraqi situation. And Mr. Egypt thought they lost their significance. I mean, because in the past, Arab-Israeli peace meant Egyptian-Israeli peace in the first place. Israel, sorry, Egypt claiming to be the leader of the Arab world leading the Arab world in a certain direction, but this time, this chaotic situation, Egyptians thought they were losing ground. And they were losing, they thought they were losing their significance uh, in the eyes of the Americans. So uh, if they lose their significance in the eyes of the American administration, they thought they would lose economic as well as military uh, aid in terms of financial assets, money, or uh, weapon systems, or, uh, and also political support. So that was, again, something which uh, impacted the Egyptian security. Again, something that Bushra had said uh, in the first hour, resentment toward the United States and, and Western powers because of their extended stay in the uh, uh, you know, Gulf countries with their military uh, capabilities uh, also had an impact on the non-state actors, non-governmental groups, and these radical groups for which actually Egypt was a very fertile ground already. Not just because of the Iraq war or prior to that. It was long before uh, a, a source of, or the, the, where the genesis of Muslim Brotherhood was there. So therefore, all of these things that we will cover, uh, considering that this Friday is the Republic Day and we will not have class, on Tuesday next week and in the uh, coming days and weeks, we will continue discussing these issues. You should make uh, copies of this and start reading, and there will be additional readings in due course. And check your emails for any instant message that may come from me. Thank you.